Well, we're um, starting a new series of messages today. Um, you're here right at the start of it. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Kind of right at the precipice. Uh, so it's going to be Harbor Values we're going to look at this summer. And all summer long, we're going to share the preaching with uh, Jeremy and Jana and myself and Libby. And, uh, and we're going to chart out the key, some of the key values that, that make our church what it is. And, and look at each one of those. And uh, today I want to uh, go back to the sign that's out in front of our church. You know, if we can't live up to the sign, what, the, what are we going to do? And out on the lit sign, it says, Harbor Church, what? For the adventurous spirit. Thank you for noticing that. <laughs> Harbor Church for the adventurous spirit, which probably was a huge mistake on our part to make <laughs> that part of our name. Um, the idea that... Uh, we're, we're a church for the adventurous spirit, and, and that is, uh, we need to understand that, and we need to understand the risks of that as we, as we go forward as a church family. So um, if you have a Bible with you, I'd like you to turn to um, 2 Timothy. This is a familiar passage for you, I'm sure, on the very first chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 3 uh, I thank God, whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I might be filled with joy. I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Get this. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. Pray with me. Lord, give us the courage to follow you with no spirit of timidity. Help us to know uh, your power and your love and, and how you can bring self-discipline into our lives. And give us the courage to look at the people around us in our community, in our world, in our families, and, and to uh, see them the way you see them. And, uh, and experience this great adventure of faith. That's our, that's our need today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... I, uh, I learned something from one of the great uh, great thinkers in our church, actually, yesterday at the breakfast. Um, I was talking with Madeline, who's in third grade, and we were enjoying uh, a little bit of breakfast and talking, and I was asking her about her work, and so she was telling me about all the writing projects that she has piled up in third grade and that she's working in, and, and so I said, well, tell me about one of them. And she said, well, I'm supposed to write a paper about an animal, you know, pick an animal and then write about it. And she kind of did roll her eyes like that, you know, <laughs> she actually really did. And, uh, and I said, well, that's really great. How are you going to make this interesting so it's not just a typical paper that a third grader would write about an animal? Which is probably not very kind to say that. But, <laughs> and, and, uh, and she said, well, uh, the way I'm doing it is the giraffe that I picked as my animal, is going to wake up in the morning and have a terrible problem. Its spots have turned pink. <laughs> and I thought, she is brilliant. <laughs> because she understands that life is about waking up in the morning and we discover the unexpected and we discover that things are not the way we thought they were or they ought to be. And then how do we live through that, right? That's what it is for us as, as Christians, as followers of Jesus. We wake up in the morning and we're following the Lord, and then all of a sudden, life has a way of kind of coming along. And Madeline can teach us this, right? And so she was brilliant, and uh, it inspired me to think about this whole thing of the, being a church for the adventurous spirit and being followers of Jesus and this adventure of faith. And what happens in that? What are the dynamics in that that make it... Um, frustrating and frightening, or rewarding and, and exciting. Both, right? So, um, 
I, I, I was thinking, you know, I've been in church a long time, like, like some, some of you, you feel like you've been a long time this morning, probably, but um, uh, I've been in church for years, and most churches, uh, about as adventurous as they get, would be like uh, taking a tour through North Dakota on a glass-bottom bus. <laughs> You know, you're just going along, and you're looking down, and you're seeing everything, and you're with some people, but you're not looking up because you don't want to miss anything. You know? And, and, and that's, that's the church experience. Woohoo! No wonder people are bored in church, right? And, and, uh, and I thought, I don't think that's what God had in mind for us. And, uh, and I, so I love when, when Paul's writing to Timothy here and say, says, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. So don't be ashamed to testify. Because God's put this spirit in us that is not a typical, dull, predictable thing. Now, I, can I share something personal? Sure. <laughs> you know I will. <laughs> Why don't you say yes or no? Okay, so here's what I'm learning. Do not pray that God will give you an adventure. I mean, that's as dumb as praying for patience. You know, where all of a sudden bad stuff happens, so you got to be patient. You know, so I made this mistake. Eileen and I were going on a vacation. Some of you know about this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were going to go up. Her, her mom died two months ago, but was born in Montreal, and Eileen's never been there. So I was going to take her to Montreal, where she could be there for her mom's birthday, which was the 25th. You know, and so booked it all. I got on hot wire, and I booked the hotels in advance perfectly so we knew where we were staying and four star hotels for much less you know and uh, I had it all arranged we had our tickets we had everything planned out perfectly because she doesn't like with me she doesn't like surprises because she says all surprises with you are bad but, um, <laughs> so and she should know so um, so Larry Stone who's I mean his knee surgery he says I'll drive you to the airport I'll pick you up and I'll drive to the airport and get you there two hours early so you can relax and get ready for your flight. So we did well. And I've got the Pam gave us a suitcase from hell, this monster huge suitcase thing, you know, that you, so you can just everything in one bag, you know. And so we get there and we go in and we're checking in and I think it's not being able to be checked in for some reason. And um, so the attendant comes and says, well, sir, you have a passport and she has a um, enhanced driver's license. And that's why she can't go. And I said, well, that's crazy because you can walk, you can drive, you can take the train, you can take the boat, you can take a bus, you can do that all with an enhanced driver's license because it's Canada. And she goes, well, Canada is another country <laughs> and you can't get on a Delta flight with that. And I'm going, well, that can't be. We have planned this. This, this, is, this is wrong, you know? So she says, Here's what you need to do. Just go over to that line over there, that long line, the help counter, and they will take care of it for you. They'll help us work this out. So we go, we wait an hour in line for them to say, who told you to come to this line? We're not helping you. you know? and, and now Eileen's going, do not say you're going to blow up the airport. That is not what you're going to do. Sir, on the ground, you know, and so, uh, and I was so frustrated, I'm going, we have to work this out, we have to work this out, they passed us to two or three different people at the counter, and uh, finally they said, okay, for $2,400, we'll fly into New York, and you can take a train or something from there, but we'll cancel your return flight, because you're not on your original ticket to Montreal, I go, well, we want to be! That makes no sense. You're not letting us, you know. So anyway, we did negotiate a thing where we could fly to Boston for only $1,200 and rent a car and then drive to Montreal and turn in the car, which I did learn an important lesson, which is that if you rent a car in the United States and drive to another country one way and drop it off, they charge more. <laughs> it's amazing. So anyway, so we did all of this, and we, we had to wait in the airport 11 hours for our overnight flight to Boston. So I said, great, let's just check this big monster suitcase from hell, and uh, then we can go through security and have lunch and everything. And they go, no, I'm sorry, you can only check your bags two hours before the flight. 
So I have to stand at this counter for nine hours now with this bag waiting to check it. So anyway, uh, Eileen goes, you're just doing this to get stories to tell. <laughs> And uh, anyway, so we did it nine, uh, 11 hours in the airport. We overnighted in two middle seats in different rows, which are cozy. And then um, uh, eight in the morning, we got there and we rented a car. And it, at eight in the morning, leaving the airport in, in downtown Boston, there's actually traffic. And uh, anyway, we got out and drove up through Vermont and everything and through the rain storms and got to Montreal finally. And um, and there was, uh, the water was polluted in the city of Montreal, it was undrinkable, and so no one was allowed to touch the water in the city. That never happens. In hundreds of years, that has not happened until I got there. <laughs> so I decided, never pray that you're, you'll experience an adventure. <laughs> because stuff happens over and over, one, not one thing, over constantly, it's all, this isn't what I planned. This is nothing like what I'd set up. And God goes, right, you prayed that you'd have an adventure. And so now I'm thinking, I'm going to get some chalk and cross out Harbor Church for the adventurous spirit. <laughs> because you know what? You come here to this church, stuff happens. Right? All of a sudden, things that you didn't think were a problem becomes problematic and issues happen and all this stuff's going on. And you think, what did I get into? Right? We, one of the cores to our ministry uh, is, you know, Susie leads us in, in prayer and sharing. Well, you, you probably didn't have any prayer requests until you came here. <laughs> and now all of a sudden, I need prayer. I need prayer. <laughs> the Lord, there's a miracle. Thank you for that. I need another one. You know, that, it's the core now because we need it. Because we're for the adventurous spirit, which means we need the Lord every day constantly near us intervening working solving healing miraculously every day because we picked a slogan for the adventurous spirit as a church and he goes okay you don't get the glass bottom bus you get a westfall tour group and many return alive not all <laughs> now it's a tendency that we have, though, when we find ourselves in situations and difficulties, it's easy to become timid. We're feeling lost or adrift or unable to make a difference and, and uh, don't know exactly what to do or what's expected, and so we tend to pull back. And, uh, and I think it's so significant that Paul, in talking to this young pastor, says, God did not give us a spirit of timidity. Even in the midst of the adventure, even in the midst of, of setbacks and problems and difficulties and pain, he did not give us a spirit of timidity. We need to hear that. What, is he, what, what spirit has he given us? Power? Love? Self-discipline? That's what he's put in our heart. So that we can go through the adventure and we can go through life together and, and with people around us in our world and we can trust God in the midst of these things. Even though uh, it's not what, we, not what we hoped for. And uh, I think one of the things that I've found um, over the years is that there's a tendency to, to settle in and live in our unhappy circumstances rather than make the change or the adjustments or to go in a new direction. Have you ever noticed that? We, we get used to something and we kind of know that pain and so, well, it's okay. Um, and, and we realize that maybe God wants to do something totally new in us, but we're not really ready for it because we, we, we know the uncomfortable thing we're in, right? And so, um, that's a form of timidity that just says, I'm going to settle in uncomfortableness rather than, than seek the Lord and seek the spirit of power and love and self-discipline and, and experience life as an adventure. 
Um, Eleanor Roosevelt has a great quote. I, I don't know, you know. It, do one thing every day that scares you. Isn't that a wise person? Do one thing every day that scares you. Well, why would you do that? It's scary. <laughs> because if you don't, you sell. You just go along with timidity. You got your life as a glass bottom bus. But when we embrace even the things we're afraid of, even the things that give us a tight stomach, even the things that we feel are out of control and we don't know how it's going to end up, something happens in us right, that uh, makes our life more of an adventure. And, uh, you know, it's funny, I, I, I've kind of made a career of regret. Um, I, I'm a specialist in that, and if you need lessons in it, I can help you. But um, I, I have spent a lot of time in regret, but one of the things, I, I thought about this, what I regret usually is never connected to the adventurous things. I don't think I've ever regretted a problematic, stressful, you know, Westfall kind of day. Um, I've never regretted those. My regrets tend to be missed opportunities. Something could have happened, but I didn't see it, and that's where my regrets are. It's never doing, doing something that was difficult. And I think about that. Maybe God wants to um, call us into a, a life of faith that's adventurous, so that we don't end up with a life of regrets, of seeing it go by but not really participating. And uh, I hope that, that um, we don't get so used to life here in the harbor, life with, e with each other, life in the, the faith that we have, that we, <laughs> that we stop uh, allowing ourselves to get afraid. <laughs> Like, can you think back of like the first or second time you came to, to visit in this church? It was scary. It was scary for me when you came, you know. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, you, you come, you don't know what you're going to see. You're kind of parking around and uh, you look at kind of the neighborhood and you go, I, I don't know, you know. Um, and, and you kind of come in and, well, there's donuts, but I don't know if I can bring them into the sanctuary, you know. <laughs> Well, the pastor's carrying them in. I guess it's okay, you know. And uh, and we don't know the custom. We don't know what we're gonna find. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, people start sharing their needs and prayer, and like, whoa, what's going on here, you know? And uh, and then some wacky pastor gets up to preach, and uh, where's the robe? My gosh, you know, in the pulpit. Now, all those things, you know, uh, it's scary when there's nothing between me and you, just us, you know. Um, but I. I think about it, I go, it would be very scary to come in here. But after a while, it's not, is it? You kind of know what you're going to find, and you know what to expect, and you kind of know the way things are, and you know which donuts you like, and which ones you don't like. Or, or if you're a donut, there's two kinds of people in the world, donut people and bagel people. They never mix. And, uh, and then you go, then it's just ordinary. And when that happens, we've lost. It should never be ordinary. It should always be a little scary. I don't know what God's going to do today. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who I'm going to meet. I don't know what I'm going to have to do as a homework assignment. <coughs> Wacky pastor making me sign up for something. You, know? uh, you don't know. That's when we come alive. When it's predictable, we don't have to come alive. Now, Paul writes down towards the bottom of chapter 1. I am not ashamed because I know whom I believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him for that day. I know who I believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him for that day. 
if only we could have that same confidence that we know that we've, we've put this in God's hands for this day and we can trust him with it. Not knowing how it'll turn out, not knowing what might happen, not knowing what surprises are in store, but we can trust him for it because we know whom we've believed. Can we say that? I think, I think that's the essence of giving us the courage to start experiencing the, um, the adventure. And when we know that he is able to keep us, to care for us, to uh, heal us, to hold us, when we know this, then, then we're free to start saying yes uh, to the possibility of adventures. And, and I think it, it is a mental thing. I think we have to, in our minds, be prepared to say yes to adventures instead of usually, you know, what I tend to do is I wait until I get, it. oh, I'm in an adventure. Oh, it's, ooh, wow, yeah, there you go. What am I going to do now? I, I don't usually start out looking for one. That'd be, that'd be dumb, you know. But what would happen if in our minds we're going, okay, Lord, Show me an adventure today. Who am I going to meet? Who am I going to have a conversation with at the office? Who am I going to see at school? Who, uh, who are you bringing into my life that makes me a little nervous? Or am I having to share something that I haven't shared before? Or encourage in a way I haven't encouraged? I may have to look up and see that there's other people. Then we start saying yes because we're, we're ready. And... and uh, And I, there's another thing, and that was that, as I think about this, you all know I'm a negative guy, you know. <laughs> I confess it. <laughs> I don't necessarily repent, I just confess it. Um, and, and so, everything is impossible to me, right? You know, there's not a good idea that you, you haven't come up with that I haven't opposed initially, you know. <laughs> that case, uh, dream to have this breakfast, I fought her every step of the way. This is a bad idea. This won't work. Who's gonna, you're never going to get 30 kids in here in a magic show, a science show, whatever it was. And, uh, you know, who's going to make the pancakes you know, and, and all that. So I did all of that. She ignored every single warning that I put up. She totally ignored every morning. And I told Neil that yesterday. I said, every bit of advice I gave, she ignored. And he said, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> no. And so um, the thing is that um, we had an adventure because she ignored me saying it's impossible. Right? And we need to get that way with each other. It, 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 it's not impossible. It might be difficult. It might be hard work, it might be stressful. It's not impossible. And we need to understand that and, and continue to encourage each other. Now, and, then, and then we can help people in their sin and in their lostness and their situations and, and we can help them because we have a spirit of power and, and love and <laughs> self-discipline. Now, uh, in my life I have certain mascots and uh, one of them is Eeyore. Over here, we all know who you are. Uh, if you don't know Winnie the Pooh, I'm sorry for you, you know. Uh, uh, Eeyore, that my mother had this made out of suede in Hawaii for me because she said, you are such an Eeyore. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. And so, um, but there, there is a uh, important story in Winnie the Pooh. And Damien and I and Eileen actually went to the Hundred Acre Wood the southern part of England. You can go there where A.A. Milne lived, and uh, his home is now the post office. And um, you can go out into the woods, and there's the little bridge. Y'all know what poo sticks are, the game? Where, where you throw the stick on one side of the bridge, and then you run over to the other side and wait to see which one comes through first? That's poo sticks. We played, Damien and I played poo sticks on the bridge <laughs> that was used in the book. I just, just want to share that with you. So, um, so uh, let me read the portion about this. This is um, the, now one day Pooh and Piglet and Rabbit and Roo were all playing poo sticks together. They dropped their sticks in when Rabbit said go and then they hurried across to the other side of the bridge and now they were all leaning over the edge waiting to see which, whose stick would come out first. But it was a long time coming. 
because the river was very lazy that day and hardly seemed to mind if it didn't ever get there at all. I can see mine, cried Root. No, I can't. It's something else. Can you see yours, Piglet? I thought I could see mine, but I couldn't. There it is. No, it isn't. Can you see yours, Pooh? No, said Pooh. I expect my stick stuck, said Root. Grab it, my stick stuck. It's, is your stick stuck, Piglet? They always take longer than you think, said Rabbit. How long do you think they'll take, asked Roo. I can see yours, Piglet, said Pooh suddenly. Mine's sort of a grayish one, said Piglet, not daring to lean too far over in case he fell in. Yes, that's what I can see. It's coming over to my side. Rabbit leaned over further than ever, looking for his, and Roo wriggled up and down, calling out, Come on, stick, 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 stick. And Piglet got very excited because his was the only one which had been seen, and that meant that he was winning. It's coming, said Pooh. Are you sure it's mine, sweet Piglet, excitedly? Yes, because it's gray, a big gray one. Here it comes, a very big gray. No, it isn't. It's Eeyore. <laughs> and out floated Eeyore. <laughs> Eeyore, cried everybody. Looking very calm, very dignified, with his legs in the air, came Eeyore from beneath the bridge. It's Eeyore, cried Rue, terribly excited. Is that so, said Eeyore, getting caught up in a little eddy and turning slowly around and around three times. I wondered. I didn't know you were playing, said Rue. I'm not, said Eeyore. Eeyore, what are you doing there? Well, I'll give you three guesses, Rabbit. Digging holes in the ground? Wrong. Leaping from branch to branch of a young oak tree? Wrong. Waiting for someone to save me, to help me out of the river? Right. <laughs> but Eeyore, said Pooh in distress, what can we, I, I mean, how shall we or do you think if we... Yes, said Eeyore, one of those would be just the thing. <laughs> Thank you, Pooh. <laughs> well, I read that and I thought of the church. <laughs> I thought of the church. We're sitting, we're playing our games and we're waiting and things are going along fine and out comes somebody floating by on the river who can't help themselves and they're waiting to be saved. They're waiting to be helped out of the river. And they're going around in an eddy, going around and going around. And we're going, I don't know what we could do or if we could or maybe. And they're going around and around. And at some point, we go, okay, let's help them out of the river. And I think that... That's what God wants us to be as a church. That we tune in enough and we see and we recognize when some poor Eeyore is floating along and we find a way to come alongside and help them out. Don't just go, well, it's weird that you're there like that. You know, that's what most of us do in church. But, but um, we go, no, actually, we don't have to be timid. We don't have to be... Uh, holding back in any way. We have a spirit of what? Power and love. And what's the third? Self-discipline. Self He's given us that spirit. Totally equipping us to be adventurers in our faith. I'm thinking we ought to just keep you there. I don't know. Kind of a religious symbol. <laughs> Not a church that's have religious symbols. We ought to get one, you know. <laughs> a leather ewer. That's who we are as a church, right? That's what God's calling us to be. The one who doesn't have a spirit of timidity. Now, I'm just warning you, if we take the Bible seriously, and we take seriously this adventurous spirit, oh, what a mess we're going to be in. We're going to be a messy church. Uh, folks are going to come in here with issues. <laughs> like they haven't already, right? <laughs> you know? And so uh, the question is, are we willing to look up from our games and say, let me help you. Let me help you. I know just the one who can save you. Then we're a real church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love and your care. 
Thank you that you don't let us just drift around in circles, but that you do reach down and pull us out. And, and we pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage to, to seek you and to experience our faith in an adventure and not just a boring, boring journey through life. Show us the surprises and give us the courage to trust you in the middle of them. That's our, that's our prayer, Jesus' name.